Hello and welcome to The Print. I am Sumi Sukanya Datta and we have with us today Dr. Tony Dhillon, Consultant Medical Oncologist with Surrey Hospital under the National Health Service or NHS Foundation in the UK. A British Indian doctor, Dr. Dhillon is now the lead investigator in a first international clinical trial to test a breakthrough vaccine that has been developed against bowel cancer. So welcome to The Print, Dr. Dhillon. And please do share with our viewers how important is the study and how has this vaccine been developed? Also, is there also a pharmaceutical company involved in the development of the vaccine? For which kind of patients will it work? Okay, no, thank you. Dr. And, uh, I know you're in the afternoon, it's morning here. Uh, so this trial, which I'm the chief investigator for, we've been um, developing this uh, vaccine with this biotech company based in Australia called Immugene, who essentially made the vaccine. Um, we've been designing this clinical trial since about 2020. So during the pandemic, we've been having discussions about this. And I'm a, I specialize in bowel cancer and I'm very interested in this particular subtype of bowel cancer, which is about 15% of the bowel cancer population, which has a very special name. It's called defective mismatch repair. And really, it's, it's quite a technical thing. But what it really essentially means that that these cancers, as I said, 15% of the bowel cancer population are very attractive to the immune system. Okay, not all that not all cancers are very attractive, meaning, you know, that they have lots of immune cells around the cancer. Obviously, the immune cells can't get rid of the cancer. But this subtype has a lot of immune cells around it. And why that's important is that the cancer has switched off the immune system, basically, in a lot of cancers. But in these subtype, the immune system is kind of wants to go after the cancer, but can't. And what this vaccine does, it essentially takes the break off the immune system to allow the immune system to go after the cancer. So there are drugs which can do that. These are antibody drugs. But we've designed this vaccine, which can be given a few times to essentially kickstart the immune system. And the design of the study is for early bowel cancer patients. So these patients would normally have a surgery, first of all. But what we're going to do is give the vaccine before surgery to see if we can shrink the cancers down. So when they do take them out, we're hoping that a lot of the cancers would have shrunk or even might have gone away completely. So this is just a sort of summarize for early bowel cancer and of this special 15% subtype, which is very sort of immune, immune activated. But bowel cancer is the, one of the most common cancers in the world. So 15% of a large number is still a very large number of patients. Yeah. So uh, now when we talk about vaccine, uh, we usually associate it with prophylactic management of uh, this condition. In this case, this is not really a prophylaxis. This is for people who have been diagnosed with a certain type of cancer. Why is it being called a vaccine in that case? Well, it is a vaccine because a vac vaccine essentially is something which you can get to stimulate the immune system. So we're obviously used to talking about vaccines as a prevention, but you can use that same biology to treat. So there are right. other examples of cancer vaccines which don't really work that well. The issue is that cancer vaccines have been historically very difficult to design because as the, probably the best example of a vaccine that everyone is aware of is the COVID vaccine. So most of the COVID vaccines essentially vaccinate against something called the spike protein, which is the protein which allows the virus to enter a, a cell. So if you make antibodies to the spike protein, which is what a vaccine does, you prevent the virus from getting into a cell. So this is the same principle. If you produce antibodies against a protein which happens to be on the immune system, which is a break on the immune system, you activate. So it's exactly the same principle, but used in a different setting. But I get this question asked often, is that we everyone just thinks vaccines are for prevention, but it's, it's about the biology and understanding the biology. Because the pro problem with cancer vaccines historically is that if you're trying to find a protein, which is on the cancer, which is, and that isn't on a normal cell, that would be a good protein to vaccinate against. But the trouble is cancers are do belong to that person. And nearly all the proteins that are on the cancer happen to be also on normal cells. So that is why cancer vaccine development has been very difficult. And But this is a different way to look at it. We're vaccinating against the immune system. 
not against the cancer, which is, in my in my opinion, a very sort of clever way of trying to design a vaccine. Yeah. So this is the first inhuman trial of the vaccine, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. But from what I understood from your conversation is this is uh, going to be tested in humans for the first time. So it has, it has, the, been, uh, it has been tested in humans before, but at a very early stage. And all, all okay. have to have uh, safety uh, testing in humans. So this was done. So this is the phase two trial, which is going to start now, is it? So this is the phase two. So that means that we're actually looking at its activity. Okay. It's, it's efficacy. It's a randomized study. So everyone will get the vaccine. Yeah. So uh, from uh, now to, uh, we hope that the vaccine is eventually successful and, uh, you know, it gets the, it targets the cancer the way you are hoping it for. But, uh, from now to the final, you know, launch, commercial launch of the vaccine, how long do you think uh, it may take? From when will it be available for patients who uh, need it? So outside of the trial, uh, these things take quite a long time. And just, just you made a very good point here. So most, this this drug is given before you have surgery. So one of the, what, why we did this is because we wanted to see quickly whether there was a response. And you can see that in the tumor that gets taken out because all these patients will have surgery. So the question we will have to ask after the trial's done, do we, if so many people respond, there may be a point of saying, well, actually there's no point doing it and any more people because nearly everyone responded. In that situation, it may be available straight away, maybe in a couple of years, but we may want to do a bigger study. We may want to do a randomized study. So as, as I mentioned- right. In this trial, everyone gets the drug. Uh, in a randomized study, it would be half would get the vaccine and half would get um, the standard of care, which is surgery. Placebo, yeah. Well, no, not placebo. It would be straight to surgery. Okay. Because um, I think you can't uh, you can't really inject someone with nothing. You, that that probably wouldn't be ethically allowed. So you'd have to go up against uh, surgery alone. Uh, and that trial might be difficult to recruit to because. Just imagine you are a patient who has this special subtype and they've seen the phase two data, just say, and you get asked to recruit it to a phase three study, a randomized study, you'd probably be quite annoyed to be put into the control part of the study because if the response right. is so good, so that's why it might be difficult to recruit to a randomized study for this particular vaccine. Yeah. You are an oncologist, Dr. Dillon, and the field of cancer treatment is changing, changing really rapidly. There are a lot of gene, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, drugs which are available. So going ahead, do you really see a scenario when cancer like hypertension, diabetes can be a manageable condition? It won't be a dreaded disease that it is, uh, you know, seen for now. I think we're do you long think that's a possibility? I think that's a long way away from that. I think... The trouble is, no disrespect to your question, but we use the word cancer, but the, the diseases are very individual. So pancreatic cancer is different from lung cancer and breast cancer. And even within breast cancer, there's probably about five subtypes. And within pancreatic cancer, it's the same thing. I think it's a small chipping away at the, uh, the, the improvement in treatments. I think in some cancers, I think we may be getting towards a chronic illness, but I think for a lot, for example, I treat pancreatic cancer. I treat bowel cancer, pancreatic cancer, and liver cancers. We're way, we're so far away with pancreatic cancer, for example. Really, what we really need to do, if we're going to be honest with you, is that we need to step up screening. That is probably the only way to really massively improve cancer outcomes is blood tests or other very clever ways to pick up cancers early. That is really the so way. So what is, what is the real challenge, do you think, uh, because you specialize in pancreatic and bowel cancers specifically, what are the major challenges in you know treating such cancers? Well, the, main diagnosis? Yeah, the main challenge is really get, getting the patients in front of me, because normally, for example, the pancreatic cancer, it can take to three to four months to come and see the oncologist because they have non-specific symptoms, they go back and forth to the doctor, and only when the doctor thinks, hmm, maybe this person's got cancer, do they get a scan done? And that can take a while. And by the time they come and see me, they've got advanced disease and the disease is incurable. So that's why, I mean, right. there are lots of sophisticated blood tests out there which can pick, detect cancer in the blood. So that really points again to screening. 
I mean, I really, I love the cancer biology and I like designing treatments and trials, but really the bigger picture is picking up cancer early because those that is really the best way really to improve uh, outcomes. Now, deviating a little from uh, the vaccine and the cancer uh, landscape, uh, we would also like to know about your Indian roots. Are you still connected with the country? Do you visit India regularly? No, I'm absolutely connected. I speak Punjabi. My parents uh, were born in India. They actually were born in British India. They were born in the late 40s okay. before independence. And my grandfather came here in the 50s. I have relatives in India. Um, I haven't been for a while. I, I've I've got young youngish children, and I desperately want to take them to India, and they desperately want to go. But you know, being a British Indian is a very important part of my life. I, I see my parents all the time. We speak Punjabi. You know, we uh, eat Indian food all the time. So you know, I'm very proud of my heritage. Yeah. Can you please also share your views about what do you think about the medical and health facilities uh, in India? Also, many public health experts actually want a NHS-like system in India, given the uh, you know very high out-of-pocket healthcare expenditure that Indians have to incur towards uh, accessing uh, medical facilities. Do you think such a system can actually work in India with such I mean, a massive population? It, 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 it desperately needs a national healthcare system. I mean, I saw a horrible statistic that a quarter of the world's poorest people live in India and they don't have access to healthcare. And uh, for a country which everyone says is on the rise, not having a national healthcare system is a real shame. You know, I know that India puts rockets into space and has nuclear weapons and uh, the science base is very strong, but not having a national healthcare system is, is, a, is a travesty, tell the truth. I know, obviously, it's the most populous country in the world, and that would involve a lot of resources, but the benefits for the people would be just outstanding. And we, we obviously have a national healthcare system in the UK, it's not perfect, but there's access to top healthcare for everybody, regardless of how wealthy you are. In India, obviously, the elites have these elite institutions that they can go to and they pay. And I have a, I have a cousin who's a doctor in India and I understand the system, but it's a real shame that there's no national health system in, in India. I don't know what the whether that's a plan for the Modi government, for example. I've got no idea, but it doesn't sound like there's anything in the up, up in the horizon. So have you followed this uh, health care scheme, uh, health insurance scheme that was launched in India a few years ago? It's called Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroge Yojana, under which the poorest of the people are given, uh, you know, in INR, uh, 5 lakh rupees coverage for accessing secondary and tertiary care, health care. So have you followed this? What do you think about this? Scheme? No, I haven't that, heard about it. That does sound like a, a first step. And are, in practice, are people using it? Is that true? Are people using it? The yeah, people? a lot of people are actually using it, but how much uh, has it benefited? It's something to be uh, yet to be seen in uh, you know reducing India's out of pocket uh, healthcare expenditure. And has there been lots of good public relations in the in the poor places to notify people that this exists? Is it is that what they've done? Yeah, I know that's fantastic. That's a, that's a fantastic start and. You when you do go to India, you do see the the poverty, and uh, it's very sad. And uh, you know, I think uh, we really need to follow the Chinese lead on this, where you know the the healthcare provision in in China is outstanding, and they're really desperate to recruit. I mean, I've I've been recruited for jobs in Shanghai, etc., and they really want uh, top class uh, healthcare for their people. And I think India need to follow suit. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, sir, for joining the conversation. Thank you so much. No, not at all. My pleasure. Thank you.